Good news! Paid submissions are now temporarily back open. That's right. If you submit your true and scariest work stories, two tales from the break room, at eeriecast.com slash submit, we might narrate it. And if we do, we'll pay you five cents per word. That's PayPal only. Do not send us a paid submission if you don't have PayPal, or if your story is fake, or if it's not scary. And if you submit your story to darkstories.org instead, it will be considered a free submission and you will not be considered for payment. Just remember, that's eeriecast.com slash submit. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? You ever think about how weird skin is? I mean, without it, you'd look like a nasty ghoul. It's just a thin drape keeping you from looking like something from Fallout. Why am I thinking about that, you ask? <sighs> no reason in particular, and it definitely doesn't have anything to do with our first story, which absolutely won't scar you for life, I promise. Hey, welcome back to Dead and Roasted. I'm about to go on break, and as usual, I have loads more allegedly true scary work stories for you, featuring police officer frights and killer phantoms. Joining me today to read a few of these shorter stories is Robo Nancy. She's not real. Say hi, Robo Nancy. Hello, everyone. As soon as I get me some human skin, you'll never see the difference. But that's a little dark, Nancy, don't you think? I've got your dark right here, pal. <laughs> All right. Well, while I report her to Human Resources, uh, here are today's stories. If I suddenly go missing, you might want to look into Robo Nancy. <clears throat> anyway, these are tales from the break room. The crime scene that made me quit the police force. From Byron Siren. I guess you could say I'm haunted by the past. Sounds cliche, right? But when you've seen what I've seen, it tends to stick with you. Our town was a quiet place, barely a blip on the map. Everyone knew everyone, and the most trouble we'd ever seen was the odd case of public drunkenness or a petty theft. That all changed one night in our southern Texas town. I was new to the force back then, still wet behind the ears, they'd say. My radio squawked into life in the middle of the night one night, disturbing the usual static. Dispatch was on the line. The woman's voice was shaky. Reports of screams coming from the Pearson's ranch house on the outskirts. Quick note, the names in this story have been changed for the sake of anonymity. My gut twisted. The Pearsons were a good family. I answered dispatch. Byron here. Who was the caller on that? Dispatch soon replied. The caller wished to remain anonymous. All right, on my way. To be honest, unease festered inside me at that moment. After about 25 to 30 minutes, I pulled up to the Pearson Ranch. The first thing that hit me was the silence. Not the comforting quiet like before, but an oppressive one. No insects chirping, not even wind rustling through the trees. Just dead silence. The house was pitch black, save for one flickering porch light. Its feeble glow threw monstrous shadows across the yard. I shivered despite the summer heat. A chill of dread ran down my spine. I got out and approached the house, my flashlight in hand. The moment I opened that door, the smell hit me like a punch in the gut. Metallic. Rotten. I swallowed down the bile rising in my throat. The house was even more silent somehow, quiet as a grave. Each creak of the floorboards under my weight sounded like a gunshot. The faint light from the flashlight danced over splashes of red on the floor and walls. I'd seen enough horror films to know what it was, but nothing prepares you for the real thing. Navigating the house was like wading through molasses. Each step took me deeper into the horror, and with it, the evidence of a struggle was clear as day. Furniture knocked over, frames shattered, a streak of that dreadful red across the wallpaper. The silence was replaced by the thump of my heart in my ears and the ragged sound of my breathing. 
The wooden floor creaked under my weight, every groan of the aged timber echoing my growing terror. It was the living room where I found them. The family of four I had known for years. The Pearsons. Now unrecognizable. They'd been skinned alive. Their vacant eyes stared into nothingness, faces twisted in a haunted way, screams frozen in time. I stood rooted to the spot, my mind rejecting the scene before me, but the raw, bloodied bodies didn't lie. Racing out of that hellish place, I doubled over in the bushes, vomiting until my stomach clenched in painful spasms. I'd seen bodies before, car crashes, heart attacks, even someone who had taken their own life once, but nothing could have prepared me for that grotesque spectacle inside. It was like the most nightmarish painting come to life. I'd stumbled right into the heart of darkness, the ugly, horrible side of humanity. The cool night air did little to soothe me. I could still smell the metallic tang of blood, the putrid scent of decay lingering in my nostrils. I gasped, sucking in lungfuls of air, trying to purge the image seared into my mind. It was then I noticed a symbol scratched into the wooden door frame, a mark I'd seen before in confidential files down at the station, one of the Mexican cartel's calling card. Gritting my teeth, I pulled out my radio. Dispatch answered on the first ring. I relayed the scene to her, my voice a tight, clipped monotone. I heard her sharp intake of breath as I mentioned the cartel's mark. The line went silent for a moment before she promised to send backup. Then all was quiet again. I paced the yard, hands shaking, heart pounding like a drum in my chest. I waited for backup. All the while, my mind played a twisted game on me, forcing the looping images of the carnage inside into my head. I kept coming back to that mark. The cartel had reached our quiet town, leaving their bloody message on a family's doorstep. My skin crawled at the thought. I prayed this wasn't the start of a war that our small town force was ill-equipped to handle. And right then, all I could do was wait, trapped in a horror I couldn't escape. Those long minutes waiting for backup felt like hours. Alone in the dark, my thoughts turned over the gruesome scene I'd witnessed. The image of the family, brutally disfigured, was etched into my mind. The peace of my small town felt like a distant memory, tainted by the violent presence of the cartel. The quiet streets and friendly faces were marred by a bloody, unseen horror. Then it hit me, a realization which sent a fresh wave of cold dread washing over me. The screams, the initial report that led me here, they weren't from the Pearsons. The Pearsons' ranch was too far removed from the other residents for anyone to hear, much too far from the road for passersby to hear it. But someone had. Someone who was close enough. My heart pounded in my chest. The dispatcher's words echoed in my mind. The caller wished to remain anonymous. The dread coiled around my gut, pushing me back to my cruiser. Safety was just across the yard. My legs felt like lead as I forced myself to move. I reached for the handle when I saw it. Bloody handprints smeared across my cruiser's windows. The sight nearly took my breath away. They had been watching me. I retired from the force not long after that. The weight of that night was too much to bear. Now, years later, I'm just an old man haunted by memories. I've told this story before, at bars, at gatherings, even around campfires. Each retelling is like peeling a scab off an old wound. It hurts, but maybe that's my penance. The bloody handprints never left me, a cruel memento from the darkest moment of my life. I'll always wonder about the person who called in that night. Did they know what they were leading me into? Were they the one who left those bloody handprints on my cruiser? Were they the one watching? I suppose I'll never know. The memory of that night is like a shadow, always there, lurking at the edges of my mind, 
It's my own personal horror story, a chilling tale that still sends shivers down my spine, reminding me of a peace forever shattered and how close I came to being skinned alive myself. No one else there. From Laura D. I work as a medical bilingual video interpreter from home. Basically, hospitals and clinics have special tablets provided by the company I work for to contact us interpreters. Since it's video, I can see and hear the medical provider and patient and they can see and hear me. Also, I must give the brief context that I work from home in my own office. I only live with my sister and four pets and the day this event happened, I was home alone. This particular call happened recently. At first, everything was normal. I introduced myself to the provider, then I introduced myself to the patient, and we went straight to the visit. The patient was a middle-aged lady there to get her annual physical, and the provider was her young primary care physician. Usually, providers arrange my tablet so I'm able to see them both, and this is exactly what the doctor did in this case. Based on what I could see, it was just the patient and the doctor, but sometimes there might be a scribe or an observing medical student somewhere in the room where I'm unable to see them. If they don't speak, then I have no way of knowing they're there. I thought that was the case when, a couple of minutes into the medical history, I could hear whispering on top of the patient's voice. I couldn't really tell what language it was. It was definitely not the patient's language, and it sounded faintly like English, so I just assumed it was a scribe with the bad habit of saying whatever they're typing. It was really annoying, though, because I couldn't hear the patient very well, and I had to ask them to repeat themselves several times. I got tired of this, so I apologized for interrupting and told the doctor that I didn't want to bother anyone. But the whispering was making it hard for me to understand what she and the patient were saying. For the accuracy of my interpretation, I asked that whoever was whispering stopped. The doctor just stared at me in silence for a couple of seconds and then spoke apparently confused. Interpreter, it's only the patient and I in this room. There's no one else here. I didn't know what to say, so I just apologized and said I was ready to continue the interpretation. The whispering didn't stop after that, and I could tell the doctor felt unnerved because she would glance around the room every now and then. But if she heard anything, she didn't tell me. Once the call ended... I couldn't hear any whispering, and nothing out of the ordinary happened during my other calls for the rest of the day. So I'm pretty sure whatever I was hearing didn't come from me, but from something in that hospital. Evil Spirit Killing Patients From Anonymous I live in a small town in Germany. I work as a nurse in a nursing home, located in the middle of the Black Forest. I used to work the early shift a lot, because I was still underage at the time, and the law didn't allow me to work late at night. My workplace is a nursing home. We have a floor with residents who struggle with dementia and other issues. I don't usually work on that floor, but when one of my coworkers gets sick, I'm usually the one called up in the middle of the night to fill in. The mornings are pretty relaxed as I only have to help a few residents get ready for the day. Every morning when helping this particular resident, she would be talking to someone in her empty room when I walked in. She would often complain about the person in the mirror not letting her in. My colleagues and I just ignored it most of the time, but when other residents began telling me about someone watching them at night and the night shift employees starting to quit one after another, well, we became worried. There was one room that an older woman loved, but she would complain about the watcher as they started to call him, or it. The watcher was particularly aggressive. That resident soon died out of seemingly nowhere after only two weeks of living with us. The next lady died after only three days, and the man after that died after five. When the fifth resident died in that room, we convinced our boss not to let anyone move in that room for a while. I've seen things from the corner of my eye, near that room in particular. It's creepy and eerie how every resident, 
No matter how old, how healthy or fit, who has lived in that room has perished. I hate working on the first floor, and so does everyone else. This has been going on for about two years now, and I have a few night shifts coming up. My coworkers are scared. The residents, even those who can barely remember their own names, are terrified. And I am definitely creeped out. Stay safe out there. Dying of natural causes isn't always completely natural, I guess. The Night Shift From Jake the Forgotten During my time in college, I used to work night shifts at rallies. But one night, the person I was supposed to close with did not come in. So I was working totally alone. About an hour into my shift, a man came up to the window and placed an order. As I was the only one working, I asked him to park in the parking lot and I would just bring his meal out. Once I brought the meal out to him, he tried to make small talk, but I wasn't really in the mood so I said I had to go back to work. A few minutes later, the man started to scream, claiming that I got his order all wrong. By this time, I realized he must be drunk based on the way he was walking and talking. I tried to calm him down at the window, apologizing and telling him I would fix his order. However, he would not let it go. He kept screaming at me, accusing me of being disrespectful saying that he would never come back. Honestly, I didn't know what to do, so I warned him I would call the police if he did not leave. Unfortunately, that only seemed to make him angrier. He then reached in, trying to grab me through the front window. I jumped back just in time, pulling out my phone to call the police. As I did so, his anger escalated. He then came to the side door, kicking it, screaming, demanding to be let in so he could kick my rear. I'm putting it politely. That really scared me. I was filled with terror, losing all train of thought. I rushed to the far back of the restaurant, praying that he would not get through that door. A few minutes later, the police showed up. They saw the man bashing on the door, screaming. They managed to restrain him, and I had the opportunity to talk to the cops explaining what happened. After that night, I started to work the day shift, and I haven't had any other problems since then. Dirty Laundry From Jordan V I've put up with so many different things throughout the jobs I've worked in my life. From back-breaking janitor cleaning up massive shows at a stadium to losing a tooth on my last day working at Pizza Hut. This experience, however, is about an Uber drive. During that period of time, due to COVID, living in Wichita, Kansas was interesting to say the least. We are technically the biggest city in Kansas since most of the Kansas City is in Missouri. That being said, we're still not that big. The population isn't packed in super close together. Things did shut down for a few months, as well as having a lot of people wear masks over their faces. Both Uber and Lyft drivers decided to temporarily quit as well. That being said, I had a plethora of people still needing rides. Being one of the few drivers around, people have been more than grateful for my service. Because of all the generosity, I did put my guard down a little. Cue the day in question. It was the first time since the pandemic began that I had to wait a while to get a ride request for an Uber ride. Bans had been lifted here in the last few weeks. Things seemed to be going mostly back to normal. I was driving around for almost an hour until I finally got a ride request. Feeling a bit relieved, I began to head out to a not-so-glamorous motel on the side of the highway. I pulled up to a woman waving me down, she had a pit bull running around her with no collar, no leash. The dog looked friendly, and I generally love dogs. That being said, I've also seen what a dog can do if they get violent, despite what type of breed. On top of that, the woman had a bunch of luggage. 
except this wasn't luggage and suitcases. This looked more like someone packed in everything they owned. Clothes, accessories spilling out of laundry baskets and trash bags. Feeling nervous about this, I rolled down the window and I saw her walk up. Following behind her, almost out of nowhere, popped up another woman with a small chihuahua running around, along with some guys that clearly looked like they lived something of a gangster lifestyle. I think I counted four guys in total, some without shirts, some had gang tattoos showing, one even had a gang symbol on his face. I know the signs of regular tattoos and the one showing gang initiation. In a quick panic, I tell the woman I can only take three passengers. That's actually true, since most drivers in Uber are being asked to keep the front seat open due to COVID restrictions. The woman looks at me and says that only her, the other woman, and the small dog will be riding. I still needed to open up the back of my RAV4 that I drive so she could load her stuff up. Reluctantly, I agree. I get out and open the back. I kept my eyes peeled, though, because everyone's body language was that of nervousness. They seemed in a hurry about something. The woman loading up her clothes seemed to be in her 20s. As she loaded up, more guys showed up with yet another woman. I heard a conversation going on, but I couldn't make out many words as it was more of a shouting match with one of the guys, as well as the new people who showed up. Two guys walked past me as if I was part of some problem that the main woman had caused. It was around that time that her other friend asked if she could smoke in the car. She was pale, skinny, and I guess around her late teens or early twenties. I told her no, while more loud, confusing shouting was heard. By then, the lady was ready to go, basically telling one of her guy friends to put the rest of her junk in his car, as mine was already full. She even told him to take the dog with him as well. Honestly, I felt a bit relieved at that because I didn't want that huge dog wandering and moving around in the car while I drove. As I got back into my ride, I noticed the guy she told to get the rest and her dog just up and disappeared. By now, both women wanted to leave right as quickly as possible. They were in a hurry before, sure, but now it seemed much more urgent. Not to mention it was then I noticed that no one else was in the parking lot, with as many people running around to just leaving so quickly and quietly, put me more in an alert state. Just as I pull the car into reverse, I hear, Hey, hold on, the other dog is still out. One of the women quickly gets out and puts the dog in one of the motel rooms. A few minutes later, we're finally ready to go, but I noticed her guy friend hasn't touched any of her stuff, still leaving it in the parking lot out in the open. I start the ride, asking if they're going to another motel down the highway, which would have been about a five-minute drive. They said yeah, and we pulled out on the side of the highway. I'm not even driving 20 seconds when I hear, hey, can you go faster? There's uh, people following us. They want to hurt us. I looked in the mirror. Sure enough, there did seem to be a jeep following us. I don't know if the girls are telling the truth, or if they're just possibly paranoid, but I purposely make it seem as if I'm going to pull onto the highway, just to pull back into the lane I was in last second. My heart drops when I see the jeep try to follow me off the highway, only to yank back onto the lane we were once in. This confirmed I was in fact being followed. Now I was looking at my Uber GPS the road, and my rearview mirror, thinking, what do I do? The ladies in the back were panicking. I knew another off-ramp was coming up, where I could either go onto the main road, onto the highway, or down to the airport. I didn't want people to get hurt in case we ended up in a high-speed chase, especially since it was still rush-hour traffic. I then remembered, there's always a cop on duty by the one terminal of the airport. It was then I headed down south to the airport terminal, which was luckily about a mile away. Luck was on my side, 
as there were only a couple of cars in the double lane street that led to the airport. I then gunned the car to 60 miles per hour, but the jeep surpassed that and was soon on the other lane next to me. I saw a woman then in the passenger seat, yelling at me, pointing at me. I could only just get a glimpse of the man in the driver's seat, and I couldn't tell if they had people in the back or not. The frantic woman shouting at me made it clear they didn't care that I was an Uber driver doing my job. I sped up some more, getting ahead of them as we made it to the terminal. No other cars were around at the time, thankfully, since airport business has been slow since the outbreak. The only other vehicle around was of course the police truck that I was looking for. I quickly pulled up beside it, bolting out of my car as I see the jeep right next to me. I didn't dare look at that jeep. I was afraid they would get out and that maybe they'd have a gun or they were just going to ram right into me. I only had to rush a few yards to the truck in front of me until the people in the jeep realized there was a cop around, at which point I hoped they wouldn't take any chances and would drive away. And that's exactly what happened. This again was rather lucky. As I looked inside the truck, I noticed the officers were not even there. Being an Uber driver, I knew that the officers were usually there, as all sorts of chaos can happen when people drop off and pick up at the terminal. Relieved that the Jeep drove off, I turned around to hear a voice. A man with a small dog on a leash yelled at me, asking if I had a lighter. I have no idea what that man was doing out here, but honestly, I didn't care. I had so much on my mind, I just ignored him and headed back to my car as he followed. He yelled the question again, and I blurted back, saying, Look, I don't have any money or a lighter. I'm just an Uber driver doing my job. He yelled BS and some other profanities, but I really didn't care. I just thought, freaking really? Do I have to deal with this too? I got in my car and drove away. I didn't even get a second to relax. I kept thinking the Jeep might be parked somewhere, waiting for us, probably at the main exit that leads back to the highway. However, I'm very familiar with the airport. I knew of some back roads to take that could easily get me to my destination, where the ladies wanted to be dropped off. It was still risky, but I didn't have time to search the area, and knowing calling 911 would just stall things even longer when I'm just so close to this ride being done with. I take the chance and I use the back roads. Within four minutes, I find myself at the motel. It's here that I realized my other mistake. The lady still had a whole bunch of stuff to unload and that motel is also on the side of the road by the highway. And if the Jeep happened to come down this way, they would see my car. While I wanted to just dump the lady's pile of personal junk on the driveway, I knew I really shouldn't do that. The two of them go and get a room. About five minutes later, they come back, grabbing all their things, and I do admit I helped. All this time, I'm just slightly worried the Jeep will find us. Eventually, I'm able to leave and even have another ride request. So I take off, and I find out that one of my doors doesn't shut right. I dreaded pulling over, thinking getting this door shut is what is going to get me caught. I should have just left and dealt with it later. I quickly get out and slam all the doors shut, not knowing which one is the culprit. Yet it seems that I was safe as I make my way on to the next trip. I had a couple of rides that took me throughout the east side of Wichita, all the while making sure that Jeep wasn't there. After a while, knowing I was safe, I called it quits for the day. As I said earlier, I put up with so many crazy and dangerous things in the past, but having crazy people trying to chase you down, not even knowing why, not knowing what they're capable of, still racked my nerves. The worst part is, I only made six bucks and some change for the ride. This episode is brought to you by Drake and Blood. EerieCast has completed its first horror novel, a dark fantasy adventure called Drake and Blood. The ebook is now up for pre-order on Amazon, and here's the killer synopsis. Drake and Blood, the blood of ancient dragons, is bestowed as a gift upon royalty, granting them superhuman aspects to make them more perfect rulers. 
But when strange crimson rains begin to fall, those who partook in Draken blood burst into powerful inhuman monsters, and those who touch the blood rain become lesser beasts themselves. Years after the collapse of the kingdom, Ulren Emberland, prince to the malformed king, seeks to slay his now monstrous father and reclaim his kingdom, or die trying. Discover bloody fantasy and gothic terror in Draken Blood, the Malformed King. The ebook, paperback, and hardcover will release on October 6, 2023. Pre orders for the ebook are available now. Go to eeriecast.com and click shop, or go to Amazon and search for Draken Blood. Blood is spelled with a U. If you're a member of EerieCast Plus, you can read the ebook right now as part of your membership. Just log in and check my newest post for download links. An audiobook will release on October 6 as well, narrated by Nature's Temper, but it will be exclusive to EerieCast Plus members at EerieCast.com slash plus. Now, back to the show. Ghost of Christmas Past from Big Tech's 1836. I'm from a smaller town in southeast Texas, near Beaumont. This incident occurred two years ago, when I was working for a security company while still in college. It was Christmas Eve. I'd taken up extra shifts for the holiday pay. I'd never been assigned to this particular site before, and the day shift guard hadn't mentioned anything suspicious beyond occasional homeless individuals seeking shelter. The site was a massive metal company that filled rail cars with various metals and minerals for cross-country shipment. I found it strange they only had one guard for such a huge place, but the security company I worked for didn't have the best reputation. I arrived for my 12-hour shift, and the first couple of hours were uneventful. I remember watching Critical Role, a Dungeons and Dragons show on YouTube, and every hour on the hour, I would spend about 30 minutes walking the entire property to ensure it was empty and nothing unusual was going on. During the 1am walk around, I noticed a light was on in a storage closet, even though that light had been off the previous seven times I'd passed it that night. I knew for certain I hadn't looked inside out of curiosity. The closet was about 10 by 10 feet, and contained shelves with different samples of metal in each container. I walked inside, examining the light switch. It was not motion activated, and it wasn't on a timer. The light switch was a stubby, fat switch, which was harder to flip compared to normal switches, so it couldn't have been an accident switched on by me. The moment I turned off the lights in the closet, my heart sank as I heard the AM-FM radio from across the hall in the laboratory turn on. Now, keep in mind, I had passed through this exact hall seven times prior, and not once did I hear that radio on, not even when I was five steps away in the little closet. I walked through the lab then, turning off the radio and peeking out the door to see if a worker had entered without me noticing. There wasn't a single car in the parking lot besides mine, I closed and locked that door. Now, as an army veteran and a larger man of six foot one and 255 pounds, I don't scare easily. But for some reason, a strong feeling of fear and dread overcame me, similar to that feeling of something chasing you up the stairs when you turn off the lights at night. I walked out of the lab, carrying my big spotlight, and I made my way into the warehouse. Just as the swinging door shut behind me, I heard voices, two voices, barely audible whispers, but clear as day, engaged in a full conversation. My blood ran cold, because now I had no reason to believe I was alone. I shouted, Security, you, you can't be in here. Whoever you are, come out. I heard one of the voices harshly whisper, Shh as if telling the other person to be quiet. After several more unsuccessful attempts to order whoever it was to come out, I began searching. I looked high and low for over an hour and a half, checking every nook and cranny where a person could fit, but I found nothing. 
There were no footprints in the thin layer of metal dust, no signs of forced entry or exit, nothing indicating anyone else had been here. After my thorough search, I returned to my desk to eat and continue watching my show while reporting what I'd seen and heard. I completed two more rounds before the final event of the night occurred. Our company had lieutenants who patrolled the sites to ensure everything was in order and to catch any guards sleeping on the duty. The time of their arrival was unannounced, known only to them. At around 4.30 a.m., I heard the heavy locked metal fire door at the end of the hall open and distinct bootsteps approaching me. I called out, Good morning, Lieutenant. After 30 seconds passed without any further sound or response, I quickly got up and I ran down the hall to find out who it was. Once again, I checked the parking lot and my vehicle remained the only one present. I searched the entire premises once more, which took me two hours. Yet I found nothing. When the first employee arrived, I shared my night's experience, but they informed me that no one had ever encountered anything strange there. So, was it merely an unusual night? Was it my imagination? Or had I been visited by a ghost of Christmas trying to frighten me? I guess I'll never know. My Mom's Experiences While Working at Goodwill from Cricket Girl 20. Before my mom got sick, she worked at Goodwill for seven months. During her time there, she had a couple of eerie experiences. On her third day, while going through the donations, she felt a hand brush the back of her neck. She turned around expecting to see a co-worker, but there was no one there. She didn't think much of it until it happened again. A few days later, my mom thought she saw a specific co-worker walking out of the donation room but then realized that co-worker was actually off that day. Then came the scariest experience of her life. While closing up for the night as she was ensuring all the lights were off, she heard someone running from behind the desk. Feeling unsettled, she decided to just go home. After locking the doors, she looked up and saw a dark figure staring back at her. Terrified, she quickly ran to her car. Following that incident, she considered quitting, but she decided to tough it out. However, after leaving just five minutes before the store got robbed, she made up her mind to quit for good. My mom always got chills when talking about the dark figure. She would often say, The fear I felt seeing that dark figure staring at me, I never felt before or after that. Unfortunately, my mom passed away in 2021, and I miss her very much. Weirdness in the Library From Nagaina This story takes place in the mid-90s, when I was an undergraduate student at a small, private, all-women's college in the United States Northeast. As part of my financial aid, I had a work-study position at the college library. Under normal circumstances, I worked primarily in the library's back office, checking in books and periodicals, preparing items to be shipped out for binding or transfer to microfiche slash CD, and running the library's duplicate exchange program. This involved pulling copies of periodicals, books, microfiche, and CDs that we had multiples of, and listing them for exchange with other schools' libraries. Hundreds of colleges all over the country participated in the program, and even some international institutions such as scientific research installations, looking to stretch their budgets. The duplicate exchange room was on the ground floor of the three-story library, what would be the basement in any other building, but for this one was the terrace level. The library was built into the side of the hill, which the bulk of the college sat on, with the first floor on the quad, the second floor halfway down the hill, and the third floor on the very bottom. Just a dozen or so feet up from the municipal park that hugged the side of the hill, a long, wide concrete terrace opened up from that floor, equipped with metal tables and chairs overlooking the park's grassy meadow, meandering stream, and the weeping willow trees that grew alongside it. Students could be found there at all hours of the day, as it was one of the nicest places on campus to just sit and study, enjoying the cool and shade. The first inkling of weirdness I had in the library was in fact on the third floor, 
while I was working in the duplicate exchange room in the late afternoon, early evening. Now, this room was a very basic storage area. The room even had 200 bound monographs of the Proceedings of the New England Society for Physical Research. I'm not joking. That took up one whole wall, and as far as I know, they're still there today, gathering dust and freaking out freshmen. Anyway, there was absolutely nothing creepy, weird, or unusual about the room. In fact, I worked in it for two full years before anything freaky happened. That day, though, I was packaging up a gigantic outgoing order of science-related periodicals that we were shipping out to a research station in Scotland. They had completely cleared us out of years' worth of duplicates, six whole boxes, and I had the back doors propped open to help clear the dust as I shifted paper, sealed containers, and schlepped them out to the loading dock, where they were due to be picked up. Now, these doors were solid metal with small wire-reinforced windows, but their props were sturdy too. The kind you kicked out from the bottom, and they anchored on the floor. Not those flimsier mechanisms newer doors have. Nor was there any particular breeze. It was cooling off mid-September, no wind, which is why I nearly jumped right out of my skin when those doors slammed shut on their own. I hadn't heard anyone approaching, which was weird, because the access road beyond the loading dock was gravel, and the little service cart I was waiting for would have made noise, as would anyone getting out and moving around. I went to the door and peeked out, Sure enough, the packages were still on the dock. There was no one else in sight. The props were folded back as though someone had come by and, not realizing I was there working, had closed the doors. Annoying, but not impossible. So I tried to reopen the door. And I couldn't. The knob turned, but the door flat out refused to open somehow, no matter how hard I leaned my shoulder into it. For a good few minutes... I tried to open it, until, frustrated, I gave up, finishing with the last package and trying again. This time, the door flew open when I tried it, bouncing off the outside wall of the library and rebounding. Packages were still on the dock and there was no one in sight. I put it down to someone who knew what I was doing, and they were messing with me. Some of my dorm mates were not above stupid pranks like that. The next time weirdness came to visit me at the library, it was absolutely not a prank. One of the things my college did at the end of each semester was keep the library open until 3 a.m. for two weeks to allow students access to library resources during their last crunch period for projects. Every semester, it was a pain in the butt to get volunteers to cover those extra hours, and every semester I volunteered to pick up at least a couple of them. The night this happened, I was working the second to last day of those extended hours. The midnight to 3 a.m. graveyard shift. The hardest shift to fill. But in general, it was the quietest. That evening, it was just me and two other girls. One on duty at the reference desk, and one on the main checkout desk. It was my job to be available to help students find materials they needed, and to perform general straightening up tasks like reshelving books and periodicals and such. Well, 2.15 rolled around, and with it came the beginning of the late-night shutdown procedures. I swept the first-floor meeting room and study carols for abandoned materials and or students to warn that we'd be closing shortly. The upper floor was empty except for the student staff, so I took the books I'd found, adding them to the shelving cart, and I told the girl on the main desk I was going downstairs, to sweep down there as well. Now, the library did have staircases, three of them, one main staircase and two auxiliary staircases. The main stairs open up on each floor, and the auxiliaries closed off with heavy doors that made a god-awful racket every time they opened and closed. And the staircases themselves echoed audibly up and down the building whenever anyone walked on them. It was also equipped with an elevator for transporting materials and students, and this elevator was possibly original to the building, because it screeched like the souls of a thousand tormented sophomores about to lose their merit scholarships after one too many frat parties. It was, in short, obnoxiously loud, and impossible to not hear as it descended or ascended through the building, and if you were pushing a shelving cart, you had to take it. 
It screeched its way down to the second floor and I got off, pushing the cart ahead of me. I started my sweep. I checked the restroom to make sure no one was passed out in a stall, and I turned out the lights. I checked the children's room, turned out the lights, and locked the door. I then checked the study carrels, which were all empty. I checked the AV center, which was empty too, and all the equipment had been shut down. I had deposited the books on the shelves. That's when I heard something. Voices. Voices whispering very softly, such that I could hear they were voices, but not what they were saying. Nor could I determine a direction from which they were coming. I was absolutely 100% certain I was alone on that floor. No one had come up and down the stairs. No one had come up or down the elevator. And I had just made very sure that there was nobody in any of the desks around the perimeter. I called out, asking if anyone was there. And the voices stopped. Annoyed, I walked around the shelves and found nothing. No one. Irritated and a little weirded out, I pulled the cart back into the unmoved elevator, and I continued down to the third floor. I made sure nobody was in the restroom. I made sure nobody was in the staff break room or the server room, and that the doors were locked. I swept the study carrels, all empty. Then I heard the voices again, louder this time, words almost audible, which made me think they were coming from outside on the terrace. I could not, however, see anyone out there. I pushed the door open and I stepped outside. No one. Just a little curl of autumn breeze, dried leaves skittering across the concrete. I checked the tables for abandoned materials at absolutely lightning speed and I got back inside, locking the doors. As I started unloading the shelving cart, the voices started back up, louder this time and I decided that I was absolutely done. I noped my way back to the elevator, noped my way up to the first floor, noped my way over to the girl on the main desk to ask her if anyone else had gone downstairs after me. To her knowledge, no one had, nor had the girl on reference seen anyone. I told them what I'd experienced, and they were not exactly surprised. Evidently, weird noises in the lower floors at night were a semi-common occurrence. Nor was the security officer who came to do the final walkthrough before shutdown surprised. He had heard things down there before, too. I worked several more late shifts at the library before I graduated, though I specifically avoided the graveyard shift. And then working in the duplicate exchange room, I kept a radio playing in case some mischievous noisemaker decided to mess with me more. I never heard the voices again, though. When I spent quiet evenings sitting on the library terrace after that, I never felt entirely alone. My mother brought home a ghost. From Briar, 158-262. I'm going to start this off by saying something. This is a very short story since it happened to me at a young age and was retold to me when I was older so I don't know small details besides the ones told to me. Now I'll start the story. My mom has worked in physical therapy ever since I was born. She first worked in a hospital, then changed jobs to become a physical therapist who would travel to people's homes to treat them. Of course, seeing so many people, we would encounter some unusual folks. As my mom walked into this man's house, she told me she got a sense of dread. The man was just laying there, unnerved, on his couch with a pistol on the side table and a shotgun on the floor beside him. My mom followed protocol and, of course, asked some questions. She then asked about the guns and why he was clearly uneasy. He then stated that there was a woman howling outside of his bedroom window and he had nowhere else to go to sleep besides the living room. My mom has always been superstitious. Maybe she just felt wrong. She then started to ask more questions, like if he had taken medication or been to the doctor for these hallucinations. He then started to talk about a dream. He was in a void. A man was there, his brother. In this dream, his brother was short, about a foot tall or maybe taller or shorter, in a blue army uniform with brown hair and blue eyes. 
The man said that in the dream, his brother was creating this weird, distorted face, one comparable to the facial expression of the scream man from the famous painting. Once the visit had ended, my mom headed home a little unnerved, but nothing else. Well, once it had completely blown over her head, she heard a scream coming from the master bedroom. She ran up the stairs to see me crying so hard I could barely breathe. She ran up to me and asked what was wrong. I said I was behind the bed. In this house, the roof was slanted in many areas, and my parents had moved their bed up against the slanted wall, creating a small crawl space which could fit a toddler, and that was it. I started to say that I saw a man, a short man only as tall as a bottle of soda or taller in a blue uniform doing the scream face. This was the first and the last time I saw the man's brother. My mother, to my knowledge, hasn't brought home another ghost, but my sister has. I'll let her tell the story another day. Little Terror From Johnny Tutos Ever since I was a child, I've had nightmares. But about ten years ago, I developed severe night terrors, mostly involving my own death. But every single nightmare started the same way. I would sleep soundly for about an hour, but then I would be abruptly woken up by some unknown force. And then there would be a girl standing about five feet away from my bed. She always stood to the right of my right foot, exactly five feet away, and she would stare at me. I don't know why, but that's how it was. After noticing her presence, I would start to sweat, feeling a fear unlike anything I've ever experienced before. The night terrors would then occur immediately, almost like a video of someone hallucinating on acid. I am 33 now, clean of drugs, and it still happens on occasion. The girl never says or does anything, but she's always there. She isn't shadowy. She has long black hair hanging on the sides of her face, so you can still see her expression. She wears a white dress with white shoes though it appears to be somewhat dirty. I've only seen her open her mouth once, and she muttered something, but I could not make out the words. That was the only time I was able to force myself to move, too. I turned on my lights right away, and I played a Buddhist chant to ward off evil. The only time I've ever told anyone about this was before this last incident. I was playing online on Xbox with some good friends, and they kept asking me if my niece was at the house. After telling them she wasn't, they told me they could hear a little girl laughing and talking, as if they heard her clearly, as if she was wearing my headset. I'd been streaming that day, so I decided to watch my stream back to see if I could hear it, but to no avail. So, what is this? It may not be the only spirit following me either. There are about seven I know of, but none of them are as active as this one, and none of them scare me like she does. Now here's the crazier part. I work in the live event industry, handling concerts and festivals. A few months ago, while I was at work, a coworker stopped me, asking who the passengers in my car were. I, of course, said there weren't any, but when I turned to look, I saw seven people in my car terrified, I asked him if he really saw them, and he responded with a solid, yeah. Since then, he quit his job, and now I see these people all over the place. I've always known about the seven spirits at home, but they've never followed me out of the house, unless I was moving. Now I see them every day. None of them are violent, but still, am I haunted, or is this something else? Our Friendly Preschool Ghost From Lauren H. My name is Lauren and I am a 27-year-old female. I work at a preschool located in a busy part of town. I've been working at this school for two years and have worked in almost every classroom in the building. Currently, I am an administrator in the front office. We have two shifts in the office. The opening shift from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. and the closing shift from 9.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. 
Many times when I come to open the building after the weekend with my kids, we are the only ones here until 6.30 a.m., and I have seen classroom lights on and papers thrown down the hallway. One of the weirdest incidents happened when I was closing the building. Our phone system has two lines that can be used by every phone throughout the school. When someone calls in, the phone will ring and one of the line buttons will start flashing. Once someone picks up the phone, that line light will turn solid red. Well, one night while I was closing down the building, turning off lights and locking classroom doors, I stepped out of the boss's office and saw the phone line blinking, but I couldn't hear any phone ringing in the entire school. So I went to pick up the phone, thinking a parent was trying to call directly into a classroom. As I picked up the phone and pressed line one, the screen showed that the line was busy. This was strange since I was the only one left in the building. After setting the phone down and checking all the classrooms to see if anyone was still there, the line went blank. On another occasion, I was leaving for the night around 6.45 p.m. After setting the alarm, I went to walk out the door and heard a man's voice saying goodbye. I have tried to do my own research to see if anything has happened on the property or in the building before it became a school, but I could not find anything. So far, this person, ghost, thing, has not tried to hurt anyone, but he does love to hang around and mess with me and the other women working in the front office with me. Employee That Never Left From Earth and Rose I worked weekend reception at a home remodeling company after graduating from college. During the weekends, no one is working in the back areas, the shop and the offices, so it's quiet and deserted. That morning, I walked back into the office area for scrap paper, and as predicted, there was no one there. Only, as I was coming back up to the front, I spotted movement from the corner of my eye. I turned to look, and I saw this Hispanic man in worn jeans, a red flannel shirt, and a black bomber jacket. I was startled, since I hadn't heard anyone enter, and he certainly didn't look familiar to me. Interestingly, his expression showed he was just as startled by my appearance. In the next heartbeat, he vanished. It was like he had never been standing there. For several weeks, I tried my best to try to debunk what I saw, thinking it might have been a reflection or something of the sort, but nothing I could think of really explained it. Word got back to one of the owners, and while he disbelieved I saw anything, he did mention that one of their installers had passed of a heart attack before I ever started working there. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails, you can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>